Greetings, I'm Shad, and as you can probably tell, I love giant swords. I've already done several videos exploring kind of the mechanics of what it would be like to fight with a giant sword, the interesting limitations that would actually arise. And we came to some interesting conclusions in those videos, like the swords need to be made out of some type of super light but still really strong fantasy material. Uh, you would also need to be super strong, but interestingly, one of the things that you would also need, probably even more than super strength, is super weight to keep you grounded and not thrown off your feet when you actually use them. But if we could pretend we actually met some of those requirements, there is another question I haven't explored yet, and that is, how would you actually fight with them if you could actually use them thanks to one of these justifications? That's exactly what we're going to be exploring in this video. We'll start off with this smaller super large sword, and even though it is not as big as certain two-handed swords, it is super big for a one-handed sword, specifically in the width and the length. Much longer than your standard one-handed sword, unless you get into kind of rapiers, but much, much wider, therefore much, much heavier. And this would affect your movement, but this one, honestly, not so much, because if we were to pretend that I had enough strength, so even if this was made out of metal, or if it was made out of super light material, we could approximate or pretend that it would weigh just about as much as, say, this wooden prop does for me right now. And as a result, it's actually not that bad. I mean, in terms of its weight, <laughs> I noticed something interesting just then, which is why it's always really good to do live tests. It was catching the wind when I was flourishing with it, spinning it around, the actual flat was kind of catching the wind as I was swinging it around, um, which was restricting some of the ease in which I was able to just spin it like that. You can even hear it. That's really interesting. Outside of interesting limitations like that, if you keep your edge on point, okay, uh, you wouldn't change too much of the way you fight with it. The width, you know, would make an interesting kind of thing just kind of on the flat with, you know, catching the wind. But um, if it was super light, or you were strong enough to handle it, either it would add additional power to the strikes, and so you could get away with, you know, your normal strikes, but that would have a lot more power behind them. And then if you just keep your edge on point, you might not actually have to change up the way that you fight with it too much from functional swordsmanship, you know, techniques. Uh, you could, it's light enough, you could keep it on point, depending on the weight, because either if this was a super light material but super strong, so I'd actually say weighed as much as this run right here, it's still about the weight of maybe one to two kilos, which is the weight of a normal sword in that regard, and that means you can keep it on point, and if you had super strength or something, you could you'd do it without tiring too difficult. If you just had super strength and this was metal, it would be really heavy, but it wouldn't be so heavy that it would throw you off balance, um, like what you would actually get with something really insanely big, which we will explore. And so as a result, there's not too much changes with a one-handed super big sword, unless it goes to crazy sizes, but then you, you, you move to using it in two hands. Uh, as a result, you just mainly could focus on stronger, you know, slashes. You have a longer blade, which means more area control, so you could do like more kind of round style slashes, similar to what we see in Montante treatises. You could offend your back end on the reverse kind of spins, and so as a result you could do these big kind of sweeping strikes like this, where you offend the forward um, position, and then on the back swing you offend the back, and so you're going around slicing, slice, 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 kind of doing wide area control, and you can get away with it. Not only get away, you could really achieve it better because of the length. It's not as actually long as certain two-handed montantes and stuff, and so you wouldn't be able to achieve that to the level of what you could with even historical two-handed swords, but you could do more with it. And by focusing on slashes, because if it is heavier, because of the width, they would be a lot more powerful and a lot more deadly. You still have the option to thrust, but thrusting, you know, eh, you don't get the advantage of offending such a wide range, just like that. But still, because you can, like it's still light enough to thrust, that is still on the table for options. Outside of that, not too much different. And the stances, 
If you've got a shield in this hand, wouldn't be too much different, okay? You could rest it on there. You could even do some of the more technical stuff that we see in I-33. Uh, with a kite shield, it's <laughs> harder to get away with that one. But, you know, something even more technical, you have the ability to still manipulate the sword enough to do those things. And yeah, I think you would definitely use a shield or even another weapon because you're using a one-handed sword. And the, the whole point of this is that it's a much bigger, longer, than average one-handed sword. And so you have the offhand to have something really cool defensive like a shield, and then you could really kind of combine it with the, the cool ways that you fight with shields, get it with the defense. So not too much different. What really mixes things up is when we get into the giant, giant two-handed swords. Oh boy. This thing is a monster. Uh, credits to uh, Tyrant is uh, working with us now, and he made this. He's actually has a lot of experience making props. And uh, this thing is a beast. As you saw, much taller than your average e greatsword, even historical standards. So this is a monster in terms of length, and most definitely width. Uh, interestingly though, there are some swords you can find historically that almost match this length, but they weren't meant for combat. They're called bearing swords. We uh, believe them to be mostly ceremonial. But if you had, again, the strength to be able to use something this long, or it was made out of a mag magical material, okay, any one of those justified reasons, that's a question. How would you actually fight with it? Now, to match a lot of the fantasy stuff that we see in video games and other things, we've made it match the width of a lot of the fantasy ones, even though width isn't as necessary. I have a whole video where how would you want to make a two-handed sword, uh, sorry, a giant sword, uh, even having something this wide, so not, not as wide as this, but as wide as my fingers are showing here, right? It would still easily be heavy enough, depending on the width, okay? And I'd have to have some measure of width in it, otherwise it would just bend and break. Again, super material, you get away with it. But even if it was just, say, yay wide, it would still be crazy heavy to get all the power you need in it. And having extra width wouldn't really be a necessity. And then you might assume, well, what if you want to block with it? It's not wide enough to block the range of a shield, but I have got another video experimenting on combining a shield and a giant sword, and I call it the Schward, it's a joke name. I think there's other names you could come up with that would be better with it. That is a, a giant sword that you could, that's wide enough to be used as a shield. We're not going there, we're actually looking at the more stereotypical fantasy giant swords, which usually have about this width to them. How would you fight with it? Now, just like with the one-handed sword, it's interesting to even compare or pretend and say this fantasy giant sword, if it's just as heavy as this wooden one is to me, already, we got some interesting things, so this is a heavy sword. This is heavier than a lot of two-handed swords. And not only is it because of the mass um, and overall weight, more because of the torque. Because it's so much longer, the stress I feel on my hands is pretty high. But I also, that's an, an interesting advantage, because even if the weight is from the torque, it's not so heavy that it's tipping me over like a lot of real fantasy giant swords would be if they were made of metal. If this was metal, and it weighed more than me, the point of balance is further out, and it'll literally just, make, even if I have the strength to lift it and throw it a kilometer, if I don't have the weight, like we explored in the video, it just tipped me over like that. But okay, now we can pretend I either have the strength to lift something metal, and it weighs as heavy as this, and then my weight is grounding me enough so I don't tip me over. So we can pretend I have that, or it's the super light material that's also really strong that makes it the same approximate weight as this wooden one is here. And so I can lift it and manipulate it as easy as I can this one. How would you fight with it? Now people might be questioning, would you even want to fight with it? If you could, I very much suspect people would. Swords got surprisingly big up to here, not as big as this, but up to here. And some of the advantages they found in, tr in using such swords was something that we, you know, talked about in the one-handed section, and that is crowd control. Big, wide swings like this, just slash, 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 slash. And you can absolutely do this, like I'm doing it right now, and if the sword did weigh as much as this one here, you can do it, and that would be intimidating. But I'm already running into something interesting, and that is, what would be the rest position? My rest position, I, look, I'm resting it right here. It's not a terrible, it's not a real combat one, but because of the torque and how heavy it is on the top end, uh, yeah, resting on the ground and then on your arm layer, which is what I'm doing now. But in terms of guard, standing guard rest positions, this would, is already really tiring. I would not want to hold this long at all. This would be terrible, honestly. Uh, Actually, it's terrible because it exhausts you. If you've got the stamina and super strength, and because I know Cloud in um, Final Fantasy does something like this, if you can get away with it, 
you know, all right, all right. If you've got the super stamina, just do that. There's an issue doing it that way though. You're presenting your sword forward. Now, with a regular sword, you can accelerate it pretty quickly into a slash or a cut and stuff. This has greater mass, which means greater inertia, which means harder to accelerate. And the cutting, like, yeah, you don't know, like, by having it back on a, in a wrath position, resting on the shoulder, this is ready to go. And already got the wind up for a big slash, okay? Before I go to the type stacks, let's explore other stances. So I did mention kind of a wrath or on the shoulder stance like this. And if it's a, a sharp blade, you want some type of padding or something so it doesn't cut you, of course. Uh, that would work decently enough. Holding it honestly right up vertical is pretty darn good. And you can keep it elevated. You don't need to keep it elevated too much. But there, what's interesting, because the blade is so wide, you even rest it on the shoulder like that, and that's actually quite comfortable. And I don't, don't need to hold all the weight on my arms anymore, and this is pretty good. Actually, right there isn't bad at all. And so one of the other kind of elements of this video is a theme or something I've already explored on this channel about what would be a more realistic way to fight with certain swords, and that's my medieval combat reference tag, hashtag, and also playlist. This is one of those videos. This is like a medieval combat reference for super giant swords because we see in video games super giant swords a lot, and oftentimes the way that they're fought with is really bad. Uh, like if we look at Eld look, I love Elden Ring. We look at the uh, animation specifically. They're swinging it about wildly, over swinging in a really crude, uncontrolled fashion. And I think there's are ways that you would fight with it much more realistically. That could still convey the weight, speed, and strength behind the strikes that look far more controlled and precise. Like you've actually trained with it. And that's what I'm kind of want to explore in this video is ways to fight in a more controlled way that's more realistic, more functional, that perhaps could be adopted into video games. I'll just show an example of the way that it could be done. Interestingly enough, I've also found another good rest position <laughs> for the sword. That's letting it, you know, just rest right there. It's actually taking the weight and it's just kind of leaning out just like that. This isn't bad. And then I could quickly grab it into combat from there. And so you could just be like, you know, the, the winning pose, like, duh, 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 like, Hey, you just won, you're there, and then you're ready to go, and you can rest it right on that shoulder. Good to, good combat. This is actually a really good position. Why is this good? Okay, sword is elevated, and so it is ready to attack right here. How? Well, one big way is just bang, <laughs> just drop it. Now, if you really wanted to go hard, you go ah, like that. Um, you could throw your, your shoulder into it. Kind of like what they do in um, Monster Hunter. They have that giant sword where it does this big swing and the body is <laughs> flying up as it hits and stuff. You could get away with that. Another way to recover, see what I did then? So when I was down, right, lifting it, leveraging it on my arm and then pulling up like that is the way, like, much easier. It makes it center, make it resting kind of, not center of balance, but you know what I'm doing. It's a leverage point. Adds more leverage, lift it up. I can't lift it up one hand. I literally cannot <laughs> lift it up one handed like that. But if I do this, suddenly I can much easier. Interesting little techniques that we figure out. So from this position, you can also push it into a sideways slash like so, recover up. So I think this is actually one of the best. And what's interesting about that sideways slash, I was able to use my shoulder as a bit of leverage to kind of push it off into that slash that way. And so that works pretty well. Uh, Another stance, let's, let's think about this, right? Another one might actually be something, I don't know, if you had a glove that could, you could hold it, something like this might actually work because again, glove to prevent yourself from cutting your own hand, you can rest a sword like that. You would never need to with a real sword because they're so light, but this is so heavy, right? Again, if you had the strength, you could avoid the cut with a metal glove or something like this. This is actually not bad because it gives you that extra leverage point to push off into a quick attack. Where you're there, you just push off into a slash right there. Or you could go around, get it into a wide one, and then you recover and you're good to go. It's interesting how much I'm leveraging with my shoulder to recover. I think you would probably want to do that in combat, especially if you need to be quick. Like if it hit ground, you had an enemy there, it'd be much easier to just push it there, bang it off. Wow, that's a really interesting. So even in combat where I got it here and I leverage off my shoulder, push it into a cut, land there, and then I can leverage it up. I can push it down. Wow, you incorporating the shoulder as a rest and leverage points to launch off of, it's really effective. I really think you could build a whole combat system around this kind of shoulder rest slash leverage 
not only position, but movement style where you're there and you can push it off sideways and then you can leverage it up over that shoulder, hit, and then again, you get there, leverage over there, hit, push it there, and then we leverage it up. You can spin it around, get back on that, leverage it over that shoulder. And this is just really interesting where, you know, you have this whole movement system where you get there and then you can push it off and just go bang, then back in position like that. That's a really intriguing style that has a lot of practical benefit because it's so long and heavy, just that extra leverage. I love it. One of the things you might have noticed is that with a lot of the experimentation I'm doing, I'm focusing a lot on slashes and I, that's one of the main focuses I think you would generally end up doing because your area of attack, your threat range is huge with this thing because it's so long and you can do these big wide slashes just like we see with Montante treatises. What we can't really do with Montante are like underarm slashes because it hits the ground. You could do sideways slashes where you bring it sideways and hit up and you can try and go sideways and hit up but I need it, you can't let it hit the ground and so sideways and up but I'm not sure the benefit is there. Then there are of course downwards attacks, which I definitely think have a lot of power. They'd be much easier to dodge because this has such wide area of effect. Your defensive and offensive range is huge and you would focus a lot on those types of strikes and anyone who wanted to get you would have to get inside that area of a threat. And the only way to dodge is they're really lucky, dodge under or over or back or try and deflect. I wonder what the recoil would be with something so heavy, because I don't see a big hit and it bounces off. But if it does, you just rest it back there, good to go again. I think more often you would hit the person off balance, honestly. Now, when it comes to spinning, there are certain spins I think you could get away with a sword this large. Oftentimes you won't need to because d doing like a full area attack like this, spinning and, and offending your back like that, right? is probably quicker than trying to do a whole like, you know, the thing they see in video games. Video games. Oh, I just damaged my castle. That would really hurt if it hit someone. Look what it did. Uh, I'll have to try and fix that. Try and pop the, the dint out somehow. We could actually time this because we've got video footage. So I'm gonna try and do some full area spins like you do in video games, and then do stationary spins where I just spin the sword but keep myself straight, see which is actually faster. Because if you can do an, a full area spin like video games and match the speed with a hand one, it justifies it. You can think it's a wide area of effect. All right, so hand spins. <laughs> So now for full spins, me actually spinning around, I'm gonna start with a, a normal one and let that swing me into the spin. I wanna make sure I'm not gonna hit the camera. So I think right here is, is mostly safe, I hope. All right, so I'm gonna go. <laughs> okay, so first problem. <laughs> Makes you very dizzy. I am seeing stars. <laughs> Some really interesting observations then. One, the centripetal force that the sword had, that was actually, I felt it, I was pulling my arms out as I was spinning. The interesting result of that though, is that that actually helped counteract my own kind of backwards, you know, um, push when I was spinning to help me spin easier because there was a balancing force that was kind of pulling me back in, which was the centripetal force of the sword. So, well, Centripetal force, it's a false force, and uh, yeah, I think you can understand what I'm saying. But again, it made me spin, it was easier spinning with such a big heavy thing on the end like that, and I could feel the wind. If I, if I, if I angled it, right, a bit like that, the wind was actually pushing it up, <laughs> which is also really intriguing. Is it worth it though? We will see in post where we can compare the speeds. If it's equal speed, I guess so. You would be offending such a wide area. People would be very reluctant to hit you. One of the issues is, is recovering from the spin. Uh, Cause I was, I was fully just like, oh, going like that and trying to recover. I think you could into a strike or a, as you're going around, just hook it on your shoulder, ready to go like that. So perhaps the recovery is fine. If it's slower, there's no real point because you can achieve just as good a result as uh, 
as you know when you're doing the regular full round spin like that which i think might still be faster we'll see but if not if this is actually faster the full one it justifies it <laughs> wow okay i uh, wasn't really expecting that the full spinning was actually much much faster that means you can technically offend the entire area around you to a better and more efficient degree than spinning the sword just with your arms. Of course, the biggest problem being you get so darn dizzy from it. But if it doesn't happen to affect the person or hero, it actually means it's a viable technique. That is actually really cool and something that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Now look, I'm not saying this is actually effective in real combat. The dizziness issue is a big one and also recovering, but you could recover pretty quickly enough. What actually makes this more plausible is the size of the sword. And there we go. We discovered some really interesting things in actually experimenting, getting a giant sword, seeing what it's like, stuff that I didn't expect. The whole saw like shoulder leverage thing is something that actually works really effective. Trying it out in real life. It was really helpful. And as a result, I think it would be absolutely something that they could incorporate into functional swordsmanship if they could achieve it in real life. Super strength, super light but strong sword, something like that, right? They would need a, a pad or a, or a pauldron or something uh, on both shoulders, I think. And that would interestingly justify the fantasy look where you're wearing no armor apart from shoulder guards. Hey, you could do that. Cloud kind of does that. Does he have only one though? I think he only has one. Okay, two, because you definitely, got, you would use it both. Yeah. Leverage, swing, but then here, leverage, swing and slash, and then pushing off. I reckon like even full arm protection because I'm pushing off lower down as well. Really, really interesting things. I love it. That's so much, that's fun. It's really great. I love discovering things like that. Do you have any ideas how you'd think, you know, you would fight with a super giant sword? Techniques that would be helpful. Assist, love to read them in the comments below. Please do. Hope to see you here on the next video on Shadowversity. And until that time, farewell. You know, I don't think I'm done exploring the mechanics of how you'd fight with a giant sword. I had so much fun with this one and learnt so much from my experimentation, I just really want to do more. So stay tuned, please do subscribe if you haven't, because coming up in the next month or so, I'm going to experiment with chaining a series of moves, a move set, combo attacks, all with this giant sword. I also have an idea for a new giant sword design that can incorporate a shoulder rest in its actual blade. Kind of like a giant version of a Rakaso. A Rakaso is a button portion of the blade just above the hilt of a regular sword. And adding that to a giant sword as a shoulder rest so you can more easily incorporate the shoulder leveraging moveset in combat. And now I'm wondering if it's even possible to actually make a functional giant sword. These are all really cool things that I can't wait to explore. Stay tuned, do subscribe so you don't miss out. Hope to see you there. I'm scared to hit something. I got range! <laughs> it's falling apart. Oh, no.